experience for those of you that are on Facebook Live and those of you that are also on Instagram or Twitter. We are grateful for your partnership and your membership here at the New Calvary Branch of Zion. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad. And I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Let us pray our prayer of invocation. All wise and eternal creator, our, our Father, Daddy, Mother God, we come before you this morning, oh God, just to say thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for holding us in the hollows of your hand. And we ask, oh God, that you have your way in this worship experience, oh God, that we will not leave this experience like we came, but we're going to leave excited and to ready to run on to see what the end is going to be. It is in the marvelous, the magnificent, and miracle-working name of Jesus Christ, our healer, our redeemer, our helper, and our friend that we pray. All of God's children said, amen, amen, and amen. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth on today. Come on, declare the Lord will praise you because you never gave up on me. Lord, I praise you.
Amen. Aren't you grateful that the Lord never gave up on you? Amen. That you can testify and declare that God uh, never gave up on you. When you wanted to give up on yourself, the Lord continued to stay faithful. And you're here today. And your declaration is, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. And so we celebrate today. We rejoice in the goodness of the Lord and all that God has done as we just continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. We declare that this is the day that the Lord has made and we rejoice and are glad in it. And so as we come to celebrate today, as we come giving God praise, honor, and glory, we indeed welcome you to this worship experience, this 11 a.m. worship experience at the New Calvary Baptist Church. We hope and pray that something meaningful, that something significant, that something powerful blesses your worship experience, that you might be reminded that God continues to lead and deliver, and God never gives up on us. That if this moment you think, or oh, God is leading you to be a part of the New Calvary worship service, a worship family, uh, and the church family, regardless of location, uh, you feel led, we want you to go with that feeling. Amen. And know that this is a wonderful church filled with wonderful people because we serve a wonderful God. And it does not matter how you make your way, it is still virtually true that all roads lead to New Calvary. Amen. We are grateful for your presence on this day. Just want to send uh, some information to you as we continue to move forward for the news of the day, for the news of the week for New Calvary Baptist Church. We are grateful for everybody who shared uh, in our park and praise and our Mother's Day celebration on last Sunday. It was so good to see so many people, and we hope and pray that God continued uh, to bless you throughout that day and your Mother's Day celebration, and all uh, was indeed well. We are very, very thankful for all those who continue to work tirelessly to make those functions possible. Grateful for our outstanding choir. Grateful for our AV ministry. Grateful for Doc Christian and all of his setup and all of his work. And so we are just incredibly thankful to all of you who continue to make your way out. We are excited as we prepare, beloved, to share in the 86th anniversary of the New Calvary Baptist Church next week as we celebrate uh, 86 years. Amen of celebrating here at New Calvary, doing the ministry and doing the work of New Calvary Baptist Church. This is going to be a virtual celebration and take place on May the 23rd. They're planning uh, and continuing to move forward as we are looking forward to sharing with my friend and brother, the Reverend Dr. Vernon C. Walton, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Vienna, Virginia. It will be a wonderful and awesome time in the Lord. Uh, so please Please make sure that you are signing in and tuning in and uh, being a part of what we believe is going to be a wonderful celebration in terms of what God has done in terms of 86 years of ministry here at New Calvary. We are continuing to be excited about the Women's Connection. Uh, the Women's Connection Book Club meeting is going to take place. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to give you some very important dates, going to share some dates with you uh, as the book club, as the Women's Connected Club. They're going to share uh, in uh, this uh, virtual sharing, um, virtual study. Even, listen to me, even if you don't have the book, it's going to be a blessing for you, I believe. It's going to really be a blessing, so make sure you sign on just the same. Uh, and so uh, mark your calendars uh, as Do Reverend Dr. Daniel Bahuro is going to be the facilitator and share uh, with the group. Uh, May, Saturday, May the 22nd, uh, then June the 19th, and then July 17th. All of those dates are Saturdays at 10 a.m. and they will be via Zoom. Please 
get in contact with the church office for the meeting ID and further information and further details on um, the group if you need those details. But we believe uh, that it was a wonderful start uh, to uh, their group gathering, and we believe it's just going to continue and see what God has in store. Uh, I want to just spend a special thanks to the Brotherhood Ministry uh, who shared this past Saturday, and they uh, continue to move in the legacy of doing church differently because this past Saturday they had a socially distant and safe parking lot gathering. And so I'm just grateful for President Carlos uh, Adams and all of those who creatively came up with a way to come together and fellowship and share. Uh, and so if you are interested in sharing with the Brotherhood Ministry, please get in contact with the church office for further details. Uh, if you have those who are promoted or being promoted or graduating this year, and they need applications for scholarships for New Calvary, please have them uh, contact the church office. They can come pick those up or they can do those electronically, but they uh, will, the promotion Sunday will take place on June the 27th at 10 a.m. And the applications must be received no later than Wednesday, June the 16th at 2 p.m. So that you can stop by the church office or pick those up electronically. But we do want to celebrate all of those graduates and all of those who are being promoted and going forward in their dreams and pursuits of academic excellence. Uh, to that point, scholarships, uh, applications, uh, make sure that you have them in um, on or before uh, the deadline so that we might continue um, to submit your packet for uh, scholarship committee 2021, that you would have your submit those packets in care of scholarship committee, uh, committee 2021. High school graduates, uh, we're doing something a little bit uh, different for you guys um, because of um, the COVID and because of the social distancing, you can include an unofficial transcript for your high school uh, record uh, and the acceptance letter or copy of the acceptance letter of the college and the university that you will be attending in the fall. We know it can be a, a arduous task trying to get the transcript from your high school, but right now you can get an unofficial copy of that and the acceptance letter, copy of the acceptance letter. Uh, and continuing students need only to send a copy of their unofficial transcripts from their university. If you have any additional questions, you can get in contact with the church office, uh, or if you have contact with Sister Renee Kirby, uh, you can ask and inquire of her as well. Please keep in mind of all of our giving. Uh, we continue uh, to thank you for all of your giving and your faithfulness. You can give uh, to New Calvary Baptist Church, 800 East Virginia Beach Boulevard, or you can go on uh, GiveLify and make New Calvary your favorite place to give. Please make sure that you are telling people to continue to subscribe and like uh, all of New Calvary's social media pages as we continue to do this ministry in different forms. We are continuing as God has continued to bless us uh, in our, our Bible study as we, First Baptist Church University Park and New Calvary Baptist Church have continued to partner and share. It has been a blessing as we have talked about real talk African-American sp Christian spiritual formation and we have been blessed as a result of that conversation and we are looking forward uh, to sharing again we're going to have a final installment God just keeps revealing to us and showing some stuff up and so we have a final installment uh, seven is a good number seven is not only the number of completion but it's a good number for those of us who understand the history and legacy of the greatest fraternity that God has ever created and so we understand uh, the importance of the number Number seven, and so we are going to have our seventh and final Bible study this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. Oh, I'm sorry, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time and 6.30 uh, Central Standard Time as we talk about understanding how we continue to spiritually discipline ourselves for the Christian spiritual formation as African Americans. There were three questions that we want you to uh, be prepared to just kind of respond and answer to uh, as we understand because we want to make sure that we are doing the best we can in helping us grow and learn and understand. Uh, and so the first question 
question is, what has affirmed, been affirmed for you in this uh, Bible study series? As we have done this series together now for the past six weeks, what has been affirmed in your faith statement? What has been affirmed in your belief and been reinforced uh, as you have shared? Uh, the other thing is, what has challenged you? The quest second question is, what has challenged you? What has caused you trouble in some of the discussions that we've had, or some of the things that have caused you struggle to understand or to wrap your faith and your mind around. So what are the things that have affirmed you? What are the things that have challenged you? And what are the things that you are still wrestling with? Question number three, what are the things that you still wrestle with and you struggle with in uh, this series in which we're talking about, about your own spiritual formation? What are some of the things that you are wrestling with in regards to your own spiritual formation and development? And so we uh, want you to just kind of wrestle with those things and bring those to us uh, as we come to a culmination, as we wrap up uh, this understanding of spiritual formation, but also as we come to share and learn and dialogue with one another. Uh, we look forward uh, to continuing to share uh, with uh, those who are in faith and of faith. And we continue to pray as we prepare our hearts and minds in this moment with our prayer list. We pray for Brother George Cooper. We are praying for Sister Nellie Yellity. We are praying for Sister Cynthia Hanna. Praying for Brother Paul Harris, uh, who is the brother of Deacon Chavis Harris. We are praying for Kishela Roberts, who is the niece of Trustee Helen Willis. Praying for Sister Brenda Morris praying for Leonthea Miller, uh, praying for Patricia Ganey, praying for Sister LaBarbara Willis, and praying for both Joe and Dolores Turner, praying for Sister Willie Mae Turner, praying for Brother Willie Turner, and for Brother Harold Brown. We keep uh, that going to the cross as we continue to pray with one another. So won't you come and share with us in this moment as we go to the throne of grace and we evoke the Lord's presence in this place as we come. Uh, and if there are other concerns or prayers, put, please put them in the comment section so that our virtual minister can affirm and let you know that we are indeed praying with you in these particular times. So let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we go and bow together. Gracious God, how we love you and how we thank you for your power and for your grace. We're grateful, dear God, for all that you have done and all you continue to do in this place. God, we thank you for this morning's rising. Thank you for the opportunity to simply share with you that as we woke up this morning, we knew that we needed to make it to worship today. We knew, God, that we needed to make it to this particular place of worship and uh, come to this virtual spot that we might give you glory, praise, and honor. Thank you for one more opportunity. Thank you for one more day. Thank you for the moment that we can uh, rest uh, and come to understand what it means to get it right. The face, the strength, with strength and faithfulness to go back into the world and declare that there is still power in the name of Jesus. God, we're asking that you would watch over all of us and continue to bless us as we just share with one another, as we lift you up, as we call upon your name, as we look for your strength and understanding. Show us what you need us to do. Give us the direction that we need to go. God, that we might give you glory along the way. God, we pray for every situation. We pray for every Every struggle we might be facing pray that you would keep us from hurt harm and danger God that you would continue to create the healing sound um, that a vaccine uh, cannot uh, deliver but God that only your grace and your power might be able to fix God keep us uh, in good health keep us in our minds together keep us God that we would go forward believing that you haven't brought us this far to leave us watch over us all God as we share with one another whatever prayers whatever concerns are on our hearts. Hear us now as we continue to share in this moment. God, we pray for everybody on the sick and shut-in list, but not only the list, but God, we pray for everyone who is on our heart, everybody, God, uh, who we think about, everybody who rests in our spirit, who we know needs to not only hear a word from you, but needs to experience and feel your presence as you continue to bless and continue to keep us. Lead us, God, in the direction that you would have us to go and in all things we would give your name praise honor and glory we ask God that you would bless this nation bless this country bless its leaders God and let us God continue to declare 
that we trust you along the way, that in all things you've never, you've never left us or forsaken us, so we continue, God, to give you glory. God, watch over us as a church family. Watch over us as we worship and as we share together. And remember us, God, in our coming out and our going in. Remember us, God, to give us the strength to climb every mountain and to endure every valley. And we promise, God, in all things we will do our best to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it is in the wonderful, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus that the people of God who love God together say amen, say amen, and say amen. Come on, won't you put your likes up? Won't you put your hearts up and receive this choir that's going to bless us as they usher in the spirit as we prepare to hear God's word on today.
God, how we thank you for this moment, how we bless your name, how we are grateful for the ways in which you show up and just reveal yourself to us. So God, now as we center ourselves, as we center ourselves for this moment of proclamation, we ask that your presence would be with us, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, that we might be filled with your power, your anointing, your will might speak to our hearts, and that we might have the courage and the faith to respond, that in all things we would be transformed in the renewing of our minds, that we might be filled up until we want and need no more. Bless this, your instrument. Allow it to play your music of grace and mercy. Allow me it decreases, thou increases, that these beautiful people might see less of me and more of thee. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of thy grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. It is in the wonderful, majestic, and marvelous name of Jesus, the people of God together say, Amen and Amen. Come on, won't you thank God for this awesome choir that has blessed us and continues to bless us in his worship experience in this worship season. Uh, amen. Please know that as we continue to prepare ourselves for worship, we look to return on May 30th as we come back uh, to the sanctuary uh, in limited capacity. So make sure uh, that you are paying attention to the information that will be shared. Uh, we have a video that will be uh, posted and presented uh, that will give instruction, but we also want you to make sure uh, that you are reaching out uh, and being in contact uh, as soon as possible uh, so we can get uh, back to worship and sharing with one another. I call your attention to John chapter 8, uh, beginning at the first uh, verse, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It shares this way in the New International Version. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the ground and uh, group, stand before the group, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Uh, verse 6 says, But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I want to talk from this idea, this thought today, brothers and sisters, the cure for cancel culture. A cure for a cancel culture. Uh, this past week, you could not help but notice 
Republican Party chose to vote and replace Congresswoman Elizabeth Cheney, a representative from Wyoming, as the House Republican Conference Chair, the third highest seat in the Republican Party. Ms. Cheney was ousted from this position not because she was found out that there was a campaign uh, snafu that revealed millions of dollars of misused funds. She wasn't voted out because she had a torrid affair with some Hollywood hunk while she left her husband at home. She wasn't fired from the position because she had paid sex with prostitutes or because she lied under oath She's not even being let go because she was caught drinking and driving and caused an accident that injured several people. All of which, by the way, have happened to other Republican Party representatives. No, Liz Cheney was let go and relieved of her duties because she said the election was not rigged. The vote of the new president was not stolen and the former president needed to be impeached for his actions on January 6th, and she voted to do so. She was relieved from her duty of responsibility to the people because she wanted to tell the truth and do the right thing and was not afraid to speak up about it. Now, you need to know on the onset that I am not a fan of Liz Cheney. I will hold my opinions to myself about how I feel about her father and some of her voting positions. However, when we have moved to a place in society where we remove people from position because they are courageous enough to tell the truth, we are beginning to deteriorate as a society. The thing about this is that the truths she's talking about aren't really hard truths to face. This is easy, low-hanging fruit. The election was not stolen. Somebody lost. That's not controversial. That can be proven. But the Republican culture, as it is right now, has decided to cancel Liz Cheney because she wants to do the right thing. Cancel culture, my brothers and sisters, is a current thing in our society that they call cancel culture is a form of ostracizing someone and creating ways to thrust them out of social and professional circles. To be canceled is to be a part of a whirlwind process where efforts are made not only to call you out for certain behaviors, but to actually forget that you exist to remove you from a place of relevance or involvement in the circles of discussion. Cancel culture happens in social media, it happens online, and it happens in person. The reasons for someone being canceled can be something that a person said or did, a comment or remark that has been made, but you can also be canceled because people disagree with you meaning that you have said or done something that doesn't have to be offensive. It can just be a different opinion than somebody else's. We're not talking about boycotting. We're not talking about peaceful protests. We're talking about cancel culture, which is something different. We're not talking about moving the needle to change things for better for society. We're talking about literally making people irrelevant for their position. People will attempt to cancel you because they don't agree with you. People will try to cancel you because they are trying to silence your voice. People will try to cancel you because they don't want you to have any more influence than you already have, and they will make efforts to vilify you in the process. Why am I mentioning this? Because the world we live in is moving more and more towards a place of creating distance than trying to find ways to work together. The world in which we exist sees creating otherness rather than togetherness as solution because things have become more and more about power than about people. But most importantly, what we will see in a little while is that this cancel culture is not new. It's an old creation. 
but regardless of what others may try to cancel you from. God operates in ways that help us to see that we don't have to engage in the deterioration of cancel culture. And no matter how much others try to stop what you were doing and stop what you were trying to do, that the Lord is able to make a way for us to be restored. That in this season, as we examine how we recover in this season and time in our lives, many of us need to know that we can recover from cancel culture that God can restore us and help us recover from what limits our situations when others try to put us in places that don't fit. The places where God has helped us recover is a testimony to a God that has a cure for cancel culture. So journey with me in this text and see real quick and understand that you have to understand that for the cure for cancel culture, you got to understand that cancel culture is based on a motive of creating restriction. See, John's account of Jesus' escapades has been inserted in this particular portion of Scripture where Jesus has gone to the temple courts and he's surrounded by people early in the morning who want to hear him and share as he teaches about their relationship with God. As Jesus is sitting down to teach the people, the text says that the scribes and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they want to use this woman to make a point. The scribes and the Pharisees took this woman, made her stand in front of the people, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. That in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, there are several things to examine in this particular text, and we'll go through them, but the first thing that comes to mind is that this is a false sense of piety. This is an artificial sense of self-righteousness, meaning that they are trying to present themselves holier and better than they really are. Uh, that their motive is always suspect regardless of the holy language that they're trying to use. What do you mean? I mean the scribes and the Pharisees are presenting this woman as being caught in adultery and they are referring to what Moses says in regard to the consequences, but they are not completely open and honest about the situation. Can I help you? You see that they are using religious reference, but they are picking and choosing how to use it. Let me help you. They bring the, women, uh, the woman to Jesus and say she's been caught in the act of adultery. But Deuteronomy 22 verse 22 and Leviticus 20 verse 10 says that it's the man and the woman who should be stoned and purged from the people. They bring her to Jesus saying that we caught her in the act of adultery. But Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6 and 19 verse 15 says that you just can't have one witness. You need at least two or three witnesses to declare the accusation and if there are two or three witnesses what are they doing catching somebody in the act of adultery see they're trying to use the law to judge but they're only using what they want to make a point and I feel a spiritual formation point coming on, and I just need to tell you that's why you need to study and discern and learn for yourself because just because folks are running around quoting things and sharing stuff that sounds spiritual doesn't mean that they got the correct application. Don't get it twisted. Just because somebody can quote Scripture doesn't mean that they're applying Scripture or using it the right way. But the other thing that is painfully obvious to the listeners of the story and what verse 6 says, that all of this was done so that the scribes and the Pharisees could cancel Jesus. I mean, the text right there in verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in, in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. Oh, you missed it. They're bringing this woman to Jesus with a theological question. They're trying to bring a biblical or, or a textual issue, but they aren't interested in adultery or interested in the woman. They are using it to try to get Jesus and accuse him of being outside the law to discredit him. 
Now, first, just let me say that sometimes you got to be careful about people because they will use you to justify their motive of wanting to destroy somebody else. Can I make this thing live? There are some people who want to pull you into their campaign to go against somebody else, and you become the pawn in the process, which means you can get disposed of the minute that you're no longer useful. That's a dangerous part of cancel culture, that if you don't play by somebody else's rules, they'll dismiss you quite quickly. Liz Cheney was good enough to be the conference chair until she stood up and told the truth. Colin Kaepernick was good enough to be in the NFL until he decided to take a knee. And now Tim Tebow got a job while Cap is still at home. Uh, those who worked in the White House, Amarosa Manigault, a former employee, lawyer Michael, uh, convicted lawyer Michael Cohen, and ex-press secretary Anthony Scaramucci, just to name a few. They were all fine with Donald Trump until his and his antics until he discarded them and didn't need them anymore. You got to be careful of people who need you for their agenda and not for their lives because you will be discarded when you're no longer useful. This is about finding a way to get to Jesus. This ain't about this woman. This ain't about what she did, whether or not she did it or not. This ain't got nothing to do with it. This is a tool to trap Jesus, to make him irrelevant. This is a way to attempt to kill his following. This is a way to discredit him and ultimately destroy his legitimacy. But the thing that makes the difference is that Jesus is familiar with the truth, and he sees them coming with the distraction. Ain't it good to see them coming? Ain't it good when you can see the truth? trouble coming, that if that don't make you shout right away, the truth is it ought to, because when you know the truth, when you know who you are, you don't get caught up in the noise of somebody else's distractions. When you know who you are, when you know what you've done and what you need to do, you'll be, you can see trouble showing up a mile away. You see, the thing is, mess will always be messy. <laughs> mess will always look messy. And when you know what you're doing, and when you know what you're supposed to do, mess will always make itself clear. The scribes and the Pharisees don't come with a legitimate issue. They come with some mess. They come with distraction. And when you know what God is up to in your life, you can recognize the distraction. Can I make this thing live? Uh, one of the teachers at the jail was finishing her coursework and collecting the end of the uh, end of the term work from the inmates. And when she was collecting it uh, get, so they could get their certificates, and one of the inmates started talking about how he ain't appreciate this process. He started attacking the class, talking about how he really didn't talk about stuff that was relevant to him, how it didn't do anything for him personally. He talked about how poorly the course was put together. He felt like he didn't feel that his life had been changed or it was making a difference, and he was trying to make it about the teacher, talking about the kind of teacher and the way she taught the class, and, the, and she waited until he finished, and she looked at him, and she said, all you said ain't got nothing to do with whether or not you finished your packet and your work. Did you do what you were supposed to do and finish your work? And he had to confess that he did not do what he was supposed to do in regard to finishing his work. And the teacher said, see, you confusing what I have to do with what you have to do. And what you have to do is, is take this material and finish it. What I have to do is give you the material and teach it and you got to complete the assignment but you can't blame what I do on the fact of what you didn't do when you what you need to do you trying to distract from the fact that you didn't have your own work done some of y'all missing my preaching sometimes you just got to say to yourself when people are talking what you talking about ain't got nothing to do with what my assignment is all of that other stuff you talking doesn't have anything Thing to do with what I'm supposed to do and what God has me to do and I will not be distracted. Can I get a few of y'all just to put a thumb up and declare that there have been some places in your life where other folks have tried to distract you but you said their distraction ain't got nothing to do with what my assignment is and as long as I understand my assignment and what God has me to do, I'm going to keep pushing forward and move past the distraction. 
That regardless of the motive that you're experiencing, you want to keep focused and not get distracted with other people's issues. But the second thing is, Jesus, is, Jesus changes the mindset to a place of personal reflection. See, watch this. The scribes and the Pharisees are using this woman as a pawn in the process to really come for Jesus. But Jesus sees them coming and he don't get distracted. In fact, can I mess you up real quick? In fact, Jesus not only sees them coming, but Jesus gives the best lesson of how to handle cancel culture. He don't even answer. <laughs> I'm in the text. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, let me tell you why that shouts me. Because I looked for any or all kinds of references to what Jesus wrote. Yes, I did. I looked at it. I did my homework, y'all. I did it. I looked at Bible dictionaries. I looked at books that talked about biblical symbolism. I looked at commentaries and study guides. I wanted some scholar, any scholar, to give me an idea and an inkling of what Jesus might have wrote on the ground with his finger. And a lot of them said the exact same thing. You ready for what they said? A lot of them said the exact same thing. You ready? They, what they said? You ready for it? Uh, they said, I don't know what he wrote. And they said, but it doesn't matter. And when I looked, they started looking and doing the research. They missed it. They said, what is said? What they said is the fact that they don't know what Jesus wrote and what was writing on the ground is not of consequence. The fact that he was writing instead of talking is the main point. Some of y'all still ain't getting it. When somebody is talking to you and Jesus kneels to write, it's a deliberate act of disengagement. And so what Jesus is saying is that what you're trying to get me to do I'm not going to entertain it. I'm not going to that level. I'm not going to play your game. Jesus is deliberately disengaging from the moment. He said, I'm not doing this with you. I'm not going there with you. I'm not dealing with the foolishness that you're trying to bring me. So Jesus doesn't engage in the mess because he knows that it's not going to go anywhere. Jesus isn't afraid to engage. Don't misunderstand this. Jesus isn't afraid to engage. Jesus knows that if he engages, it won't help anything to get to the real issue. Don't miss that. Sometimes we spend too much time and so much time engaging that it really won't change anything in the issue. What a lesson we can learn from Jesus that some things just ain't worth your attention. Uh, that when folks try to get you to go to some place with them, you just don't bother. When some place try to take you there, when some folks try to take you there, just don't engage. Can I help you? Uh, I, you Jesus knows that he's not going to change the scribes or the Pharisees' minds if he does engage. In this moment about this issue, you aren't coming to understand, you're coming to upset. And that's the difference. You need to know that there are people who are actually coming to understand a situation. But then there are people who are coming to upset a situation. And you need to be smart enough to know the difference. The setup with the woman caught in the act is not to resolve the issue with the woman. It's to get Jesus off of his purpose. Jesus says, I ain't dealing with this on your terms. Jesus says, there's a way that I'm going to deal with this, but it's not the way you want me to deal with it. Watch this. Jesus is writing. They are talking, and they keep on talking. That's what verse 7 says, that when they kept on questioning him, he stood up, he straightened up, and he said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Uh, what I like about Jesus' statement that the word that he uses, the translation of the word literally means, if any of you are without error, if any of you are faultless, then throw your stone. You missed it. Jesus' statement doesn't just cover adultery. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say, well, if any of you have been where she's been before, then go ahead and throw the stone. Jesus doesn't say, well, only you who have been in this situation, go ahead and grab your rocks. He said, if any of you are faultless, if any of you are without error or mistake, then you be the first one to throw the stone at her. You still don't get it. Jesus doesn't get specific with the infraction. 
Jesus forces all of them to look at themselves and have a serious moment of reflection. Now, what, what the difference is for them who Jesus is talking to is that their shortcomings aren't standing in front of a group of people being talked about and being judged. The reason we forget that we struggle like everybody else is because it's not our turn to be canceled. That when, we, when it's our turn to be canceled, we scream for help. When it's our turn to be canceled, we scream for mercy. We shout how unfair it is. But when other folk are on the chopping block, it's time for us to talk about what they deserve. Jesus said, if any are, if any are without any fault, if you are blameless in life, then pick up your stone and throw it at her. And see, when you start reflecting on your own faults, you might not have to check in just one category. But you got some checks everywhere else. Can I help some of us today? The Pharisee and the scribes may not have been situations of, in, a, in situations of adultery before. But because of what they're trying to do to Jesus with this malice in their heart, it means that their hearts and spirits ain't in the right place. You, Jesus is trying to help us to understand it's not just your actions, uh, it's, or it's not just your actions, your intentions can also convict you. Can I make this thing live? That if your intention is to trip somebody up, if your intention is to hope that somebody else falls, if your desire is that somebody else would not make it, that harm should come to somebody, that people will not become better, it will eventually show up in your behavior, either in action or in your non-action and doing nothing at all. Martin Luther King once said, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Albert Einstein once said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Jesus said, it's not always your action, but your motive that can cause you to miss the mark, that can expose your faults. There are moments when we need to reflect that we have missed the mark and that we have demonstrated our faults, but we never made the front page. There are moments when we have messed up and then we didn't get it right. We fell short, but we were never put on display for other people to gawk at us. There have been moments in our lives when our actions weren't our best, but nobody put us on social media or made us stand before a judge and jury. We need to know that even in some moments when nobody could see our hands, our hearts weren't in the right place. But through it all, God's grace has still been with us. Aren't you grateful that when you reflect on your own life, that God has placed grace in your situation when nobody else could have given it to you, that when the world would have exposed you to failure, God extended grace to you, that when folks would have blew you up or messed up your spot, it was God that covered you, that you did not have to confess your sin or your fault publicly, but all you had to do was confess it in your heart, and God's grace was enough to continue to keep you in your situation. Then understand that God will allow us to reflect on the places where it could have been us. God will allow us to reflect on the moments where we weren't so perfect and we weren't so wonderful, but God's grace continued to keep us. But the final thing is, here it is, see that Jesus offers us a moment, a good moment of recovery. See, Jesus says to them, if you without sin, if you without blemish or a moment when you have fallen short, then just go ahead and throw your stone at her. Then he bends back down and continues to write on the ground. And the Bible says that those who heard Jesus started to go away one at a time. One by one, they started to walk away. First the older ones, then the others. People were not only reflecting, but people were convicted because their spirits were exposed. Maybe it was his words. Maybe it was what he wrote on the ground. Maybe it was a combination of the two. I don't know. But whatever it was, stones got too heavy to pick up. Rocks were too awkward to throw. 
It didn't seem right to punish this woman when people started to think about what could have happened to them. And see, here's a very important lesson when it comes to judging others and cancel culture. It's easy to destroy others because for some, it serves as catharsis. It's cathartic, meaning we attack others because it makes us feel better. We can stone others because it helps us forget about our own struggles for a little while. But the reality is, after the moment is over and after the stone is thrown, who you are is still right there with you. The great prophet from the 70s and 80s, Theodore Pendergrass, also known as Teddy, told us a long time ago, you can't hide from yourself. Everywhere you go, there you are. And the reality is when the moment of judging others is over, you still got to deal with your own challenges. In other words, judgment or being judgmental of others just deals with them. You will always still be there. And it's more important to work on you than to focus on the consequences of others. The moment gets down to where there's only the woman and Jesus standing there. And the text says, Jesus straightened up and looked at the woman. I don't want us to gloss over that. I know it seems simple, but I don't want to run by it too fast. What that means is Jesus didn't see the others leave. Jesus is writing on the ground. He's not paying attention to who left. Jesus didn't watch who left first or who was the most convicted or who walked away with a certain look on their faces. Jesus didn't pay attention to their personal conviction. Jesus stood up after they were gone and it was just him and the woman. Watch this. At the beginning of the text, we said Jesus is there teaching people who want to hear from him. So that means it's not just the mob of the scribes and the Pharisees that left, but it's also the people who were sitting there watching him teach. All of them left one by one. Jesus wasn't looking to judge them. Jesus wasn't trying to turn their situation around into a place of good versus bad or who was worse or who was better. Jesus was calling attention to everybody to do better and reflect on who and where they were. And when it was all over, it was just Jesus and the woman that everybody accused. You do know that at the end of it all, of all of other people's judgments, at the end of all the cancel culture, at the end of all of the opinions about what should happen and what people need to do and what you should and should not have done, it will be just you and Jesus. You do know at the end of all of the opinions, the only one that matters at the end of it is just you and the Lord. People will tell you what you need to do and how you should have acted. People will have their opinions about your actions and your behaviors. People will try to make you relive what you've been through, but at the end of the day, it will just be you and the Lord working this thing out. Jesus asked her, he said, where are they? <laughs> Has no one condemned you? And our answer was simply, no one, sir. No one has condemned me. Jesus said that neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Some of y'all missed a good shout right there. Because it really set some, it could really set some people free. Jesus is saying that the opportunity to recover means that nobody can hold anything over your head. That nobody can control you with your past. That no one is able to tell you what you can and can't do based upon what you used to do. Can I help you? Jesus said if nobody else condemns you, I'm not going to condemn you. But Jesus is the one that caused others to reflect on the moment and walk away from you. So if Jesus said says there's no one who can condemn you not even me then you can release what you used to do and go forward by creating a whole new life for yourself Jesus says now go and lead your life of sin which means that go and create a new life for yourself because this life you no longer have to carry this life you no longer have to live through this life you no longer have to be reminded of and somebody needs to know that Jesus is telling you that 
that the life that you used to have, you don't need to carry it anymore. The thoughts that you used to have, you don't need to carry it anymore. The person that you used to be, you don't need to be anymore. God sees you in your full potential. So don't let what others see limit what God sees and what God can free you from. We can sometimes get down on ourselves and we get upset with ourselves when people try to remind us of where we've been or people try to remind us of who we used to be or the things we used to do or what we've been through before. But Jesus said, I don't hold it against you so I, you don't have to walk with it anymore. I don't hold it up against you so you don't have to live in that reality anymore. Walk in a new possibility. Move towards dealing what you can handle. Don't let people limit you to only what they can handle but understand God has more for you than you've ever imagined. Don't get bent out of shape if folk try to cancel you because the truth of the matter is your cancel might turn into a blessing. Somebody else needs to hear that. Other folk might try to cancel you but God says your cancellation can turn in to something that can benefit you in the long run. Here it is, here it is. Uh, I, was at, I was at an airport one time. I was making my way uh, to go to New York City. I was making my way to go to New York City and the plane uh, got called to board and we were starting to get on. The flight attendant took our tickets and ran it across that little swipe thing, right? And it would beep, beep, you know, and they'd say, thank you, how are you? Beep, she said, well, enjoy your flight. Thank you, beep, thank you, enjoy your flight. Beep, thank you, enjoy your flight. And every now and then on this flight, when she ran it over, the thing would go, ah, uh ah. -uh. And she said, please stand over there. Beep. Thank you. Enjoy your flight. Uh -uh. Please stand over there. Well, we got the my ticket. And she took the ticket. She went over the thing. And the ticket said, uh -uh. And she said, please, Mr. Small, would you mind standing over there? I walked over to the side. Everybody else got on. And she said to the group of us who had to stand off to the side, she said, due to plain overcrowding, we know we have to put you now on another flight. We're going to put you on a flight. It's going to be later. But due to the overcrowding, we're going to put you on another flight. Because of how you purchased your tickets, because you all purchased your tickets later than everybody else, uh, we have to put you all on other flights. Now, I knew that wasn't true. I knew I got my ticket in more than enough time. But I wasn't phased. I had time to get where I was going. But before anybody could have said anything, this man lost it. He got the hollering, how can you cancel my flight? I paid my money just like everybody else. Let me put it to you like this. He let his privilege show. He let his privilege show. I paid my money like everybody else. He's losing it. He's going off. He ran it and raved about this flight being canceled. I went off to the side to wait for the next flight. What else am I going to do? Right? Flight attendant looked at me. Right? Uh, and after, after she literally called the security to come get the man away from her because he was losing it, he kept going on and on for like m minutes at a time, she called me over to the desk, to the desk, and she said, Mr. Small, because of this inconvenience, we're going to give you a check, not a voucher. We're going to give you a check for $875 for your ticket. I said, Okay. Here's your first part of the shout. I only spent $349 for the flight, right? For the original ticket, I spent $349 for the original ticket. So I'm waiting for my new flight, and I called my wife. I said, babe, you ain't gonna believe what just happened. You ain't gonna believe. And, I'm, and, the, and, the, and she's over there, and we talking, and we yelling and screaming, and then he comes over to me. The dude who was yelling and screaming comes over to me, and he says, yo, can you believe this guy? Guy, can you believe this? I said, yeah. He said, did they pay for your ticket? I, I looked at him slowly. I said, yeah. And I knew what privilege was going to do next. He said, how much did they give you? And I thought about that thing. I prayed on it real quick. Let the spirit use me. I said, $450. He said, 
450? They only gave me 350, bro. They only gave me 350. I shrugged my shoulders and I thought to myself, I said, sometimes you got to be careful about how you handle a cancellation. Sometimes you got to be careful about how you handle getting canceled because sometimes your cancellation, if you handle it right, it can turn out to be your blessing. I'm wondering if a few of y'all can understand that sometimes when I got canceled, it was the best thing for me. That I'm grateful sometimes for some of the cancellations that happened in my life because it just meant God was working some stuff out. Sometimes being canceled ain't a bad thing as long as I've got the Lord on my side, as long as I'm operating in the place where God is still working things out. I can handle a cancellation because I just wait that thing out and the Lord will show his way. Is there anybody who's watching with us who can declare that I know what it is to be canceled, but I also know what it is for God to step in and work that thing out. I'm grateful for what God has happened. I'm grateful for the mountains in my life, grateful for the valleys and the problems because I wouldn't know that I had a God that was able to solve them. So I celebrate that I serve a God who has a cure for the cancel culture that tries to work in my life. And there's sometimes when you just got to understand, sometimes you just got to ride that cancellation out because that cancellation can ultimately be a blessing if you know how to play it right. So listen, we extend this invitation to you. We extend this invitation. We believe that we serve a God who is able to continue to speak, continue to move, continue to deliver. And God is still speaking. God is still speaking in virtual spaces and uh, uh, social media circles. God is still blessing. And the church is continuing to grow and understand how God can reach. And so in this moment, we extend this invitation to Christian discipleship. In this moment, we extend this invitation to be a part of the New Calvary Baptist Ch Church. The number, the telephone number is on the screen. That if you are desiring to be a part and join New Calvary Baptist Church, just go ahead and call. You can call it right now, 757-828-6121. God will continue to bless you. Go on newcav1 at verizon.net uh, and send us an email and we'll be happy to reach out for you. Somebody will pray for you and give you the instruction and the guidance to be a part of New Calvary Baptist Church. Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter where you stay. We believe that God is continuing to believe and stretch this ministry beyond the walls of not only this church, but beyond the boundaries of the 757 and so we're grateful for what God is doing so if that's you in this moment if you're just looking for God to speak to you just lift your hand and say God I need you right now God I believe you're continuing to work God I've been trying to do this thing I've been working and trying to figure this thing out on myself but God I give you it all right now I surrender to you dear God I surrender myself to you believing that your spirit can guide and lead me and in partnership we might do this thing to give you glory Show me which way to step. Show me which way to go. And God, I ask you that you just continue to bless me and reveal to me the steps for my life. And God, in all things, I give your name, praise, honor, and glory. I thank you, and we thank you as a church family for what you're doing in the lives of your people. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and matchless name of Jesus that the people of God together say amen, amen, amen. We celebrate with you in this moment. Put our hands together for what God is doing in your life. We are grateful for the New Calvary Baptist Church. Please put your thumbs up, put your hearts up for this band. Uh, for this musical aggregation that continues to bless us, for this choir that continues to help us, for these ministers who continue to share with us, these officers that continue to serve. Lottie Dottie and everybody, how ready we are to continue to come back and fellowship with one another again. We look forward to sharing with you uh, on Monday morning as we share in our uh, prayer, uh, our morning prayer at 8 a.m. and our morning prayer, please get on our morning prayer. We love to share with you uh, on tomorrow morning as well. Please share with us on Bible study, 7.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, 6.30 Central Standard Time. We look forward to God stretching all of us as we continue to walk together. And until that time, continue to love and care on yourself and take care of each other. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord place God's countenance upon you so that you might have peace both now and forevermore. And the people of God who love God together say amen. Amen, amen, and amen. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Take care. Be good. Peace.